Hello everyone to the fifth in our series of seven target antibiotic webinars in which we are discussing the management of suspected urinary tract infections. I am Professor Cleana McNulty, Head of Public Health England Primary Care Unit and PHE Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Professor Chris Butler, a GP in South Wales and Professor of Primary Care and Director of the Clinical Trials Unit at the University of Oxford. His main research interests are in common infections and health behaviour change, and he has recently been leading much research around UTI. Hello, Chris. Hi, Kiana. And then Dr Mandy Wooten is a lead scientist at University Hospital Wales and an expert on antimicrobial resistance. Hello, Mandy. Hi, Kiana. So this week, Chris and Mandy will challenge us to reconsider our management of urinary symptoms and tacit assumption that all women with urinary symptoms have UTI. While you're watching Chris and Mandy's discussion, please do note down questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A that follows. You can do this by typing them into the questions of the control panel during or after the video. So let us see what Mandy and Chris have to say. Good, uh, good day, I'm Chris Butler. I'm a um a GP but mainly a researcher and one of my research interests is in urinary tract infection. I've done some interesting uh, studies with Mandy Wooten. Hi, I'm Dr Mandy Wooten. Uh, I'm a lead scientist at Un University Hospital of Wales and I too do clinical trial work with Chris, particularly on UTIs. So Mandy and I are really excited about uh, talking today about urinary tract infection. We've done a lot of research together I'm a sort of a part-time GP, so at least I breathe the air in real general practice occasionally. But we've done some exciting studies about uh, the management, presentation, and outcome of and microbiology of urinary tract infection in uh, uh, primary care. And we, we want to share some of the uh, important points that has come out yeah. of this research and other bits of research that might help improve the management of urinary tract infection, not only the management, but I think our conceptual framework of thinking about it. Mm, I agree. Yeah. Um, in particular, uh, focusing on microbiology, what percentage of urine is positive for an yeah. infection, because yeah. we found it was quite low. Yeah, we were surprised um, by that. And also what prescribing, yeah. you know, as well as the diagnosis. But I think in that poetic study that we were talking about, uh, I think we found, certainly in England and Wales, that the vast majority of prescribing was for trimethoprim in Wales yes. and split between trimethoprim and nitrofurantone in England, in the English sites, which is kind of good news, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. trimethoprim for a long time has yeah. been the first line choice yeah. for UTIs. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, um, E. coli resistance to trimethoprim is around 35% now. Yeah. Uh, which is quite high. When it you is. compare that to nitrofurantone, which is around 3%, yep. then you can see there may be a problem with actually if it's going to treat your UTI successfully. Yeah. Mandy, I really am hoping that we can convey the need for really a different way of thinking about this entirely. I call it a paradigm shift, if you like, or something grandiose like that. But let's just imagine what's happening now in primary care. So think Monday morning, think waiting room, winter time, chaos, phones going, babies screaming, and a call comes through, I think I've got another water infection. The receptionist might do one of three things, say, fine, I'll get the doctor to leave out a prescription. Probably wouldn't happen in any of the practices that we relate to, but it could happen mm -hmm. theoretically. Or could say, well, I'll get the doctor to give you a call back at lunchtime or come in for an appointment or something else. But what we found in our research, I think, was that 95% of those people contacting primary care with those symptoms get an antibiotic. Yeah. yeah. But I think that that isn't doing good enough for our patients. Yeah. I think we could do a whole lot better. Yeah. Because what we also found is that only a quarter actually had a UTI on culture. That's correct, And yeah. there's a lot, a lot of other things that could be going here. 
And so dysuria frequency equals antibiotics. Yesterday's thinking, we need a much more sophisticated approach about this, don't we? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's not just the microbiology, it's the prescribing as well. So get the diagnosis correct. Prescribe, if you're going to prescribe an antibiotic, mm -hmm. then get the right one. Yeah. And then once you've prescribed the antibiotic, presumably the patient will get better quicker. And that's what we found with the POETIC study, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, we did. Those who got, you know, those who got antibiotics will uh, get better quicker. But there's a lot of women who will get better quicker, will get better mm. roughly the same amount mm. of time uh, mm. if you give them um, uh, symptomatic treatments such as ibuprofen. And that was shown in the recent trial in the yeah. BMJ. But I want to come back to this issue that you raised, really important about diagnosis, because... We tend to write into the computer Monday morning, hell breaking loose, UTI, trimethoprim or whatever. And actually, we don't think further than that. Mm. And, you know, UTI is probably a, 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 a range of syndromes, pyelonephritis. People are really sick with fever, often blood, loin pain, ragors. If you've got a good going case of pyelonephritis, not hard to spot. you uh, 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 um cystitis in the bladder that's very uncomfortable mm. frequency dysuria often blood in the urine nocturia can't sit still it's very very unpleasant very uncomfortable this is the typical woman who comes in you know is slightly agitated and very few of us are not going to prescribe antibiotics for those two conditions but then there's urethritis sort of irritation in the urethra yeah. and that could be following sexual activity or a range of other things that could be irritating the urethra. And I think there we've got a potential of making a lot of gains in terms of keeping antibiotics away from those who won't benefit and perhaps getting symptomatic treatment, which might help them get yeah. better a whole lot quicker and save them all the risks to that individual person that comes with antibiotic prescribing. Yeah. Yeah. And around the antibiotics, you were making a strong pitch to start with? Nitrofurantoin. towing. Yeah. Um, there are alternatives like pivmacillinam. Mm -hmm. um, that's becoming increasingly used within the UK, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you've got uh, an organism which is resistant or more resistant. So people with recurrent UTIs, maybe that might be a, a good choice. Yeah. What about trimethoprim? Well, I think with trimethoprim, um, it, it still can be used, but um, and it has been first line. But I think with the increasing resistance rate and um, you know uh, the fact that nitrofurantoin's resistance rate is so small, I think that's probably the best first line Not antibiotic to, yeah. to use. <clears throat> but then, when urines are cultured, it's fine to use, and you you know what the sensitivity. It's fine to use trimethoprim or even amoxicillin. Isn't yes, it? if you have the sensitivities, then use them. Yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah. think what I would say is also is that uh, I would steer clear of broad spectrum antibiotics like carmoxiclav. Yeah. Um, I would prefer narrow spectrum antibiotics. The reason nitrofurantoin is such a good antibiotic for UTI is because mm. the levels are very, very high in the bladder. Right. And so they're, in, they're high in places where it needs to work. Yeah. So that's why nitrofurantoin is such a good drug. Yeah. yeah. But there is a danger with nitrofurantoin, isn't it? We need to be a little bit careful. Yes, yeah. You have to be careful in terms of what scenarios you're going to use it in. Yeah, yeah like you're right. So the old, frail, sick person with renal failure yes. would be a caution. Yeah. But in the otherwise healthy women, um, it's a pretty safe drug, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. So what about people who are at increased risk? So we've spoken a lot about uncomplicated syndromes of could be attributed to urinary tract infection, otherwise healthy women. But and generally we don't need to take samples on these people, do we? No. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. But sampling is recommended when people are at higher risk. Yes. Uh, what are some of the common risk factors? So if you've had an infection in the past 12 months, a UTI, yeah. or it's a recurrent UTI that yeah. you've got. If you're elderly uh, yeah. and your renal function isn't as good as it should be, or mm -hmm. good as, as a younger, maybe, yeah, 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 debilitated, yeah, yeah, and those factors do do come into play when you're choosing an antibiotic. Yeah, and then, as I understand it, if you've travelled to an area of high resistance or 
are originally from an area where resistance is high, such as the uh, uh, Asian subcontinent, yes, yes. Uh, that's another risk factor, isn't it? That's quite an yeah. important risk factor. Yeah. Antibiotic resistance is actually a global problem. Uh -huh. um, and there are particular areas where resistance to antibiotics is very, very high. Yeah. Uh, if you travel to those areas or if your ethnicity is from there, then those are the, those are the risk factors you've got to think about when you're prescribing. Mm. And a study we did in Wales a little while back showed that if you've had the single biggest risk factor for uh, uh, a resistant compared to sensitive UTR is recent antibiotics yes. as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now, something that I wanted to talk about was this interactive leaflet that um, Public Health England is is d developing, and I, I, f I found this quite useful. Um, as a clinician because what it does is it allows you to work with the patient in the consultation to try and focus down which part yeah. of the urinary tract uh, the main problem is. And you know, if it's in the kidneys, there'd be certain types of symptoms, the bladder, these would predominate, the urethra, these would predominate. And then you can, it, it leads you very briefly in one page through those symptoms into kind of prescribing strategies based on the most likely site of the problem. Yeah. And uh, crucially gives the patient some red flags or warning symptoms, uh, uh, warnings about what symptoms should trigger reconsultation. Because if we are going to prescribe fewer antibiotics, we really have to be much better at safety netting yes. because of what you said earlier about increasing uh, incidence of um, septicemia of course, yeah. uh, from, from E. coli. And then there's also some nice prevention stuff here as well. So that leaflet could really be helpful. So, so Mandy, there's, there's audits that, that people can do to, to see how they're getting on with this. Yes, so, there are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so GPs can do an audit on what antibiotics they've been prescribing. Um, they, they have really good audit tools that you can use on the Target website, the Royal G uh, College of GPs. Yeah. Um, and these will help you look at how you prescribe uh, and what you've been prescribing. Um, and that will give you a good overview of, of what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, another website you can go to is the Fingertips website. Yep. And this will actually show you prescribing data per GP practice. Right. So anyone can look at that, whether you're yes. from their practice or not? Yeah. So yeah. you can look at what's going on in your yeah. area and you can look at what's going on in other areas. Yeah. Now, later on this year, uh, very exciting, they're actually going to have resistance rates for yes. particular areas as so well. So you can spy on your mates prescribing and on their resistance If you like well. to, yes. <laughs> yeah. The important thing, I guess, is to know what you're doing yourself. Interestingly, yeah. we did some work in Wales which actually linked prescribing at a practice level to resistance uh, at a practice level. And in a seven-year study, we found that those practices that reduced overall antibiotic prescribing the most also started to submit samples for uh, urinary culture that had fewer resistant bugs. So there is a kind of link in a way There's between, a real big link, yes. between what happens locally. Yeah. So GPs are kind of in the driving seat of this mm -hmm. uh, problem and its solution, yeah. aren't they? Uh, and yeah. these websites are, are becoming or will become uh, quite, quite important in the future. Yeah. I think GPs get, uh, they don't get enough information on things like prescribing and things like resistance mm -hmm. rates. They sort of see that as a hospital problem. Um, at, and now, of course, prescribing in general is yeah. becoming more important to get right. That's right. And there, there are all kinds of incentives and disincentives around it. So that audit tool on the Target website will also give you information about, well, it's also help you audit not only your antibiotics, but also investigations and so forth, and when and when not to investigate. So in summary, I think we've got to move away from this condition. Practices are really got to think about the way they manage and organize themselves around urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. It's common, it's a big problem for women. Uh, and but it comes in all shapes and sizes and it comes you know from the person who is so uncomfortable they can't sit still and they're in absolute agony through to somebody with relatively mild symptoms who's perhaps just a little bit worried about a bit of dysuria and we need to think about where's it coming from is it the kidneys the bladder or the urethra yeah. how likely is it to be infected 
Uh, and do we need antibiotics or not? If not, we can try non-steroidals if it's antibiotics. Uh, Nitrofurantoin probably yep. first choice, but not to forget the other antibiotics if we've got cultures. And to think about also our own personal management and uh, the target website and the order tools there and this brilliant leaflet, uh, which I think will help focus the clinicians yeah. and the patient's mind about what's really going on, yes. that this yeah. is not just one thing, it's a range of things and we need different responses. I suppose at the end of the it. day, um, we're trying to make uh, the patients get better quicker. Yeah. Um, but we're also trying to manage our prescribing so that we don't push resistance yeah. further than it should be. Yeah. Um, and those two things in conjunction, uh, I think these tools will help. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing because in the past, it was all kind of worrying about the future and societal perspectives. But I think for UTI in particular, getting the prescribing decision right in relation to the likely diagnosis or site of problem will really help patients get better quicker. Mm. And all the downsides of prescribing is located within that patient because they are going to carry problems if they're getting unnecessary antibiotics mm. yeah. or, on the other hand, not getting antibiotics when they stand a good chance of benefiting from them. Yeah. So in the past, we used to give fire and brimstone sermons about resistance worrying about future generations, and I'm not saying that's not important, but actually focusing the problem on the individual patient in front of you and the downsides of giving them unnecessary antibiotics balanced against giving them the treatment that is going to make them get better quickest, cause it's not just harm. UTI, yeah. antibiotics, and that goes back to think through a bit about a bit more. Yeah, what yeah. is the real diagnosis. Yeah. Welcome back. I think the video may well have stimulated some lively questions for Mandy and Chris. Again, like last week, if you want the Q&A in full screen, click on the icon in the bottom right hand corner. Please do keep those questions coming. So, um, Chris, I've got a question from um, Caitlin here. Um, you were talking about your poetic study, your research study. You said that only 25% of women with urinary symptoms in the study had a positive culture. Why do you think that positivity was so low? So um, those refer to patients recruited in uh, sites in England and Wales. <clears throat> and the first thing to say is that very careful microbiology was done, including spiral plating uh, by Mandy and her lab. So procedures were um, a, a bit more rigorous than in some series, but it's not uncommon to find um, such a low proportion of samples that are positive for a UTI. And we have previous studies from the UK and from, say, the west of Ireland, where we find only 70% 70, uh, 70 of, of women don't have evidence of a UTI. So we can speculate what the true proportion is, but the main message here is that there's a lot of women coming to GPs who say they've got symptoms of a UTI, GPs believe they have a UTI, who don't have a UTI microbiologically. There could be something else happening. It could be urethritis rather than cystitis, rather than pyelonephritis. And we need to get better at differentiating the site of the infection and that should be leading us into the most appropriate treatment for that patient. So leading on from that then, how can we, um, Charles has asked actually here, how can we differentiate those with and without infection? Okay, so I think one of the key things to figure out, is this uh, vulvitis or vaginitis? Is there uh, a, a discharge? And then figure out how severe the symptoms are. And if a woman just has one or two symptoms, plus a, a discharge, then you might be thinking of urethritis. And um, I also kind of think that one of the best ways of explaining this is just to get the clinical picture in your mind. I mean, we know that uh, clinical situation where a woman comes in who can hardly sit still, they've been up all night, peeing 
tiny amounts very frequently. They're extremely uncomfortable. They may have had a temperature. They can't sit still. And, and you know, that kind of person is not appropriate for delaying prescribing. And they've got a full house of symptoms. Go for it. But it's the woman who then comes in and says, oh, I think I might be getting another UTI or I think I might have another water infection. And it's that woman, I think, uh, that group that you might want to explore uh, urethritis as a syndrome and non-antibiotic treatment with or delayed prescribing. And of course, you mentioned the um, the leaflet here that yeah. we've got. And of course, it says the it's got that, it differentiates that. So you can talk through that with the patient. So that would be yeah, a good so, thing to do. So the Public Health England leaflet is a fantastic uh, resource, I think, for use interactively with women who have symptoms of a UTI. And it explains the kind of uh, different sites of infection, the different symptoms associated with different sites, and then appropriate management um, according to site and symptom. Excellent. Okay, uh, Mandy, I'm, I've got a question from Eva for you. Um, you said um, E. coli bacteremias were increasing. What can we actually realistically do to help prevent um, this increasing E. coli bacteremia? So a lot of the bacteremia, so actually um, their point of source is a UTI. Um, uh, and this set of patients have uh, it's what's called a complicated UTI. And really, again, it's in the guidance. Uh, it's very useful to um, start appropriate first line therapy straight away. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, and we have to put into place some kind of safety netting as well and again that is in the guidance. So providing patients with some uh, key pointers to actually prevent uh, the uncomplicated UTI becoming a complicated UTI. Uh, and it's really simple things like just adequate hydration mm -hmm. is one of the key things. Okay. And so, of course, one of the risk factors, you're saying getting the appropriate antibiotic. Yeah. Um, so how can you determine what, how, what are the risk factors for antibiotic resistance? So everybody carries around with them in their gut a certain set of bacteria. Uh, the more courses of antibiotics you have and the more antibiotic you have, uh, the more resistant your gut bacteria will be. And this is the source for most UTIs. So a risk factor, a main risk factor in, in resistance is actually having more courses of antibiotics, hence the push towards driving down prescribing of antibiotics, especially when they're not really appropriate. Okay, yes, and also you were saying about using nitrofurin toin um, rather than trimethoprim. So, yes. Um, so why is that? Yes. Well, we're really trying to uh, encourage the use of nitrofurantoin first line for uncomplicated UTIs in adults. Um, the main reason is because in the past we've used trimethoprim. Uh, and trimethoprim at this particular point now is reaching, the, the resistance levels are reaching the rate where they're not going to be uh, useful. It's not going to be appropriate. So. In the UK, resistance levels are around 30-35%. So every time you prescribe trimethoprim, 35% of the time they orga they, the organism is not going to be responsive. Uh, Nitrofantoin, uh, as, as a comparator, is around 3%. So you can see that nitrofantoin will actually treat a lot more patients adequately and appropriately. And interestingly, Chris, in your poetic study, the resistance rate was actually lower than the 35%. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I think that can be explained yes. partly because uh, what's coming into the laboratory is different to what is happening um, in the sorts of patients that are coming into general practice routinely. So um, you can imagine GPs don't send samples on everybody just in those with recurrence or complications. So we might find much higher uh, figures like Mandy was talking, levels of resistance in, in, in what's coming into the lab routinely. But in our study, what we did is we got every woman, <clears throat> regardless of severity, provided they thought they had a UTI and the GP thought they had a UTI, to send a sample. And over there in England and Wales, we found 20% or less of resistance to trimethoprim. And interestingly, the number of people who had empirical antibiotics 
and there was a bug that was considered to be causing a UTI that was resistant to that empirical antibody was less than four, it was around 4%. And that's because, yeah. of course, only 25% had yeah. a positive culture. Yeah. So by the time you get down to the number with a positive culture and a resistant organism. Yeah. So what we're saying, though, is in the elderly, um, we should be using um, nitrofurantoin yeah. more, yes. um, especially. But um, be careful of the renal failure. I think that's just one caveat. Okay. Yeah. So what yeah. should we do, Chris, um, in um, renal failure then? Um, what antibiotics should we be using then? So, you know, uh, trimethoprim, uh, other, other, other antibiotics. Other antibiotics. So yeah. you mentioned pivmicillinam. Yeah. Um, so pivmicillinam is a pro-drug of micillinam. Um, it's, it's a penicillin, it's a beta-lactam like penicillin, but it has a, a different target, uh, bacterial target in the cell wall. And it, this means that it, it has different activity to amoxicillin. So pivmicillinam um, resistance in the UK is, is around uh, 6 or 7%. Um, it, it's about the same in European countries, which have used it first line for com uncomplicated UTIs uh, for about over five or, five or six years now. So it's not something that, it's not a, a drug that, um, sorry, it is a drug that you can use uh, very easily. Um, uh, and, and obviously the pivmicillinam is something that will also um, counteract resistant bacteria as well. So those bacteria um, with extended spectrum beta lactamases, ESBLs. So it's very good for that. Okay. Okay, but oh, what about using, why don't we use pivmicillinam for everyone then, including those with pyelonephritis? Um, it's got a slightly more narrow spectrum and, and for pyelonephritis, I, I think I would go for a more broad spectrum. You want a big heavy hammer to, to, to sort of uh, combat that infection, I would go for co-moxiclav. And also, anything. yeah, pivmicillam isn't so good for um, bacteremias because it doesn't yes. get yes. high yeah. levels in the blood. <coughs> so yeah. it doesn't really get into the, into and, the blood. And, and well. not, not concentrate in the kidney. But I might just mention a drug that's used heavily in uh, continental Europe. Yes. Uh, phosphomycin, which we don't use here. I think it's a fantastic drug because uh, of one single dose. So adherence yeah. isn't an issue uh, as a rule, and it's very effective, low levels of resistance. Um, trouble is uh, it's not widely available in the UK, and it's quite expensive. But um, I think we probably will see more phosphomycin in primary care in the future here as well as perthmicillinam. And again, that's another drug that is good for um, any type of resistance. So uh, it's good for ESBLs. It's also quite good for carbapenemase producers as well, which we're hearing more about in the news at the moment. OK, we've had a few questions about where we can access the guidance. And mm -hmm. you can access it via the RCGP um, Target Antibiotics website or on the Target um, webinar um, yeah website as well. So all the materials that we've discussed today will be available on this website or the RCGP yeah. um, website. So there was another question about um, should patients ethnicity, um, Annie asked this, should patients ethnicity be routinely used to decide whether a patient is high risk for resistance? And if so, what would we use? So again, we're coming back to uh, patients who might harbour resistant organisms in their bacteria. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of nitrofurantoin because actually it does, it does target bacteria with extended spectrum beta-lactamases and AMPSs in, those enzymes that cause problems with uh, drugs such as amoxicillin. So nitrofurantoin is a good, a good choice for that as well. Yeah, it's good so, for first and line. It, so actually if you're using nitrofurantoin first line, your risks of talking about risks of resistance yeah. is less important. It so is. it's when you are considering giving trimethoprim, um, you know, in certain areas of the country where trimethoprim <coughs> resistance yeah. is much lower, you need yeah. to be much, yeah. um, much more careful. Okay, can I just say, Keanu, that ethnicity is sort of correlated highly with travel to certain areas. Yes. Mm. And it's, I think it's probably not so much some of the ethnic uh, origin, but actually where they've it's been. The travel. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's that's yes. more important. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, Annie has asked us about um, recurrent UTI. Mm. So um, what should we be doing um, about recurrent UTI? So um, what advice can we give women to prevent recurrent UTI? 
Um, I think a lot of the advice on the, the, the sheets that we're giving out is, is actually to, to look at standby antibiotics and um, also things like uh, cranberry juice, although that won't work in all patients. It could be taken and ibuprofen could be taken as well uh, as a preventative measure. Um, I think with standby antibiotics, uh, I think they should be reviewed quite often. I think quite often they're not reviewed enough. Um, it, again, nitrofan towing is, is good for that. We, we can use uh, ciprofloxacin uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it, basically whatever we use, it should be reviewed. So what is the evidence, um, Chris, for, let's go through some of the things, for um, prophylactic antibiotics? So the evidence in general is, is good that taking prophylactic antibiotics reduces um, recurrence. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, we get, we've got a risk of resistance with that. That's so right. we're yeah. recommending with the PHE guidance to use um, standby. So a standby if you get symptoms yeah, in the, preference. The, there's that. But if you do uh, prescribe long-term antibiotics, big danger is that that prescription just carries on and carries on and we don't review it. Mm. And so a clear guideline is to review after six months Yes. Uh, particularly if you're using nitrofurantoin, but um, you know this is this is an ongoing process, not not a one-off event. And what about um, cranberry juice? What's the evidence for cranberry juice or cranberry capsules? So interestingly, a good trial was published uh, this year uh, by Mackey, um, showing reduced recurrent episodes on uh, of women taking cranberry juice. Um, so the industry sponsored study, but well conducted. Um, and I think they found that three women must take cranberry for a year to prevent one case. In amongst that, you're going to find people who get no benefit and some people who get a lot of benefit. So my own personal approach with cranberry juice is to suck it and see really give it a go. There is a larger systematic review by Cochrane which showed tendency to benefit but nothing dramatic better studies more studies needed so there's some evidence but you know it's quite an expensive over-the-counter product so mm. they shouldn't so it might work for some women is mm. what we're saying mm. but yeah and, not, and, not sort of evidence. and in fact I'm trying to get a trial up uh, working with 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 others um, to explore uh, other options as well mm -hmm. um, so uh, D manos is, is, is something that there's some evidence for that needs further research done. Okay, so there was a question about um, the risk of um, lung fibrosis with nitrofurantoin mm. um, from Christina. So what about that, especially with recurrent um, UTI? Yeah. Mandy? So really the MHRA has, has uh, there's, there's lots of evidence now to suggest that that there isn't uh, too much connection between nitrofen and towing, um, uh, and also um, with uh, just normal uh, prescriptions of nitrofen towing, you know, especially if you're just having a one off. Three days, yes. Three so days, three days, yeah. the risk isn't the risk increasing. Is quite low, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're taking it for recurrent infection and as part of prophylaxis, then this is the that is why the importance of reviews come in. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's move on to um, safety netting. There's some worries about E. coli bacteremia. So what advice should we give about safety netting, um, Chris? And do you yeah. think that's necessary? I mean, how many people actually yeah. really do give safety netting advice and what do we need to do? Yeah, you know, I think luckily um, the type of infection that we've been talking about, uncomplicated UTI, which is by definition in a woman, in women with normal renal tracts who are not pregnant. Luckily, that doesn't uh, frequently lead to bad outcomes. Um, however, that doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen, um, but I think it's unusual, and I hold up my own hand here that I'm kind of guilty of not doing this enough, um, of telling women what they might worry about should things deteriorate. And, you know, that includes feeling too hot, getting fever, chills, uh, getting confused, um, 
not becoming aneuric, not passing urine, vomiting, high temperatures, kidney pains, and so forth. So the symptoms of the um, uh, pyelonephritis developing or septicemia developing, and, and, and that's, that, that, that's hard, but luckily rare. Um, you know, so I think that's an ongoing process of the dialogue between clinician and patient that we should be informing people about. Okay. And again, it's on the leaflet. Yeah. Okay. So there it is. Yeah. Uh, some, some nice safety netting on the leaflet there. So what do you think about um, GP practices doing um, telephone um, consultations for urinary symptoms? Okay. Because, I, you know, a lot of yeah. GP practices are doing it and you're saying about the fact that many people don't have a U proven UTI. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, what are your thoughts? So, look, the first thing I want to be clear about is that I'm not criticizing anybody here because the service is under intense pressure and clinicians have got to find a way of giving the most amount of high quality care to as many people as possible and they're going to come up with different solutions for that. And they might be giving uh, telephone advice, they might not be seeing so many patients with UTI these days and in some places receptionists might in fact be managing this condition. But again I go back to that clinical picture, the woman is saying I think I might be getting another water infection to the one with bond or cystitis and finding out a little bit more about the symptoms, this could be urethritis, maybe they are happy to consider non-antibiotic treatment initially or a delayed prescription. And there's good qualitative work from the UK and survey work from the Netherlands, which shows that you know, anything up to two thirds of women would be prepared to consider delayed antibiotics or symptomatic treatment. We've got that trial about ibuprofen. That might be given in the meantime, things may settle down. So coming to some sort of shared decision-making about those issues, I think is important. In an ideal world, I would prefer this to be face to face. The woman can be examined properly, um, and you know you can start picking up those early signs of sepsis should there be a bad, bad, bad outcome. So you can kind of check the pulse rate, check the blood pressure, get that sort of impression of how sick this person is if you see them face to face. Now that's the council of perfection. Um, I'm an academic, and I'm not so often in the real world, so it's easy for me to talk. Okay, so what do you think, going one step back, what do you think about pharmacists um, and community pharmacies being involved in the management of urinary symptoms? Do you think that's appropriate? Uh, yes, I think um, it would be great for pharmacists to be giving evidence-based advice and particularly uh, you know, identifying that group of women with mild symptoms, one or two symptoms, who might have a discharge and they might then guide them down getting treatment for their discharge or maybe some symptomatic treatment uh, such as non-steroidals, give that a go for a couple of days. But if things get worse, then they need to go to somebody who's trained in examining them and um, who could prescribe antibiotics if necessary. And they can obviously use the leaflet and yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, so um, Mandy, so when um, we got a question here um, from uh, Robin, um, when should we um, send a uh, urine for culture? So really we're talking uh, pregnant women virtually always get a culture when they present um, but by and large we should be sending cultures for when it's recurrent UTIs are going on um, and again this comes back to the discussion about whether it's a relapse or whether it's a recurrent UTI. Um, that way you've got more accurate sensitivities for your prescribing. Um, because if one course has not worked, then one course of nitrofantoin hasn't worked, then you really need to find out what the bug is and what the sensitivity is to that bug. Mm. Um, so you can prescribe more appropriately. Okay, so um, Annie says, is a lack of sentinel surveillance for urinary resistance rates actually holding us back with deciding on empirical treatment guidelines? Oh, um, more Probably, data yes. is always great, isn't yeah. it? More data yeah. is always great. Uh, and during our discussions uh, for this webinar, we've discussed the uh, figures for lots and lots of different studies and, and what they're actually telling us. And sometimes it's not always as straightforward as it, as it seems. So, so there obviously is a difference because in the poetic study with the, the women less than 65, the yeah. resistance rate was um, less than 20%, yeah. Yeah. whereas our overall 
for, for trimethoprim, yeah. whereas it was 35% overall, exactly. we're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. You've got so you've, you've got, got to, to be quite careful. And always ask what the denominator is. Yeah. But certainly when we send samples on every woman in uh, 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 admittedly small numbers in the poetic study, mm -hmm. we didn't find uh, resistance rates as high as uh, you found in the uh, routinely submitted samples. Yeah. Yeah, just just on Cleon, just to add to when to send a sample. You know, when yes. I was practicing in the bush in Africa, I used to hold the sample up to the light, and if it was clear, I wouldn't bother sending it to the lab. And then when I started to do that in this country, people said, "You're a baboon. You must go back to Africa. You can't practice medicine like that." But I <laughs> notice, I yeah. notice on yeah. the leaflet, if the symptoms are few and not severe, and the urine is clear. The chances of there being a UTR and culture are zero. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yes. So uh, that brings us on to another question about the role of dipsticks mm -hmm. and um, the quick, the PHE quick UTI quick reference guide actually goes through if there's greater than more than three three symptoms and no vaginal discharge, then empirical antibiotics are appropriate. But if there's mild symptoms and you say yes, no cloudy urine. Um, then very unlikely to be a UTI, but then if it is cloudy, that's when we should be doing a dipstick. Yeah. So what actually that takes us on actually to dipsticks and care homes. There's a question here um, about dipsticks and care homes. So what about the management of UTI in care homes and resistance in care homes? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I'll just say <laughs> something that's really important is that a lot of old frail people in care homes or incontinent and if you were to sample their urine even when they're relatively well when they're at their best you might find a whole lot of bugs in there Bristol Zoo I mean tigers lions a whole lot of things that if you were to look at this you would think wow but actually the patient is asymptomatic and there's no need to react to that and in fact all that kind of thing does is it generates unnecessary antibiotic prescribing. So I would say, and there's a point I think that comes across the whole discussion, is that we've got to treat people, we've got to treat people and their symptoms, not microbiology results. And when we send samples unwisely, we start treating them, that generates a vicious cycle of more antibiotics, even more wild animals in the bladder, and we're chasing our tails. So. I would say go by the symptoms and react accordingly. Do not be testing urine in any way at all when um, there's no clinical indication to do it. So we need to reduce dipsticks in care homes and use the criteria. There are some good criteria um, produced by a Nicole and Loeb, I think, about when to prescribe in care homes and when to send a urine. So yeah. new dysuria, new confusion. Um, a high to temperature. To, to what Chris was saying. Yes. I, I, just talking from a basic, basic microbiology point of view, um, most of the bugs that you find in a UTI positive urine are the same bugs that are in your gut. Yes. Um, so actually taking a, a bad specimen or a bad sample um, it is not a great idea for microbiology because the, the lab yeah. cannot distinguish between a UTI positive and a masked UTI. Mm. Um, it's quite difficult for microbiology to, to do that. Yeah, so I think we need to take a whole lot more care and, 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 gen and improve the evidence base for different <laughs> yeah. types of sampling. You know, at the moment I tend to say, there's a job, please go to the toilet, come back with a urine sample and maybe um, the evidence base is not clear mm -hmm. about whether careful preparation reduces contamination, but certainly in the care home situation, I think we need to be much better yeah. at capturing urine samples and we definitely need to improve the evidence base yeah. for reducing the vast numbers of urines that come back as contaminated. Some of them are going to be hiding false positives, some false negatives, and we don't know how to react to that. And if we're prescribing yeah. on that basis, then we're driving resistance even further in these yeah. patients which have already had lots of courses on antibiotics. Yeah. Hello everyone, These we're going to continue with some questions that weren't answered in the live webcast. So um, there's a question from Diddy um, about women with recurrent UTIs. Is a single dose 
after sexual intercourse acceptable? Is that of proven benefit? Yes, that has been a proven benefit to, to some women, yes. And it's a bit like we, we, we sort of lump it all together with preventative measures. But yes, that's one of the things that, that people can be by, can prescribe to, to, to people who obviously suffer from UTIs after, uh, you know, um, sexual, intercourse. sexual intercourse, yeah. Okay, and so I suppose that, that comes on from there. Alan said, would you advise a, a female patient with recurring UTI who is sexually active to advise her male partner to hand in an MSU as well to trace any cross-infection? I'm not sure I would. <laughs> Speaking as a microbiologist, I don't think yeah, I would. No. no, I mean, but by and large, the, the E. coli's that cause UTIs come from the female mm -hmm. and not the male. Yeah. Okay. And um, they're unlikely to uh, survive. I mean, they survive in urine, but not on skin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Um, okay, so there's a question here. Is low-dose prophylactic antibiotics sensible? if we are trying to limit antimicrobials driving resistance? So that's an interesting uh, question. It is, and, and the answer, if we were very simplistic, was no, it's not a very good idea. Um, but obviously, you have to take a pragmatic approach to uh, therapy. And if a patient has come back with recurrent UTIs again and again and again, the ha you've got to do something. Um, but it, it does drive resistance, there's no doubt about that. But it's a fine balance between uh, keeping the uh, therapy appropriate so the patient gets better and also limiting the amount of antibiotic in the patient and in the environment so that we reduce everything we can do to, to stop resistance being driven further. And of course the, cho the antibiotic choice we're using in prophylaxis has high yeah. concentrations in the urine. Yeah. And so although we're giving a low dose you know, it's it's a high dose. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's it's um, going to be sidle. You know, for a certain amount yeah. of time yeah. each yeah. each yeah. day. Yes. And I think, Leona, we were talking about. So, what do you do when you review this? Say, at six yes. months, uh, and there are a number of scenarios. So, if recurrences have gone on unabated, uh, well, I would recommend not carrying on with that particular prophylactic. Uh, um, approach. You might want to try a different antibiotic, different form of prophylaxis. Um, and if the person has been symptom free for six months, you might want to see how they go then without uh, prophylaxis and give them a, a, a trial of no prophylaxis. So that's exactly the question Nicole was going to ask. Okay. So that's great. We've answered that. And also, how often should you rotate prophylactic antibiotics? Mm. So again, so you've got to that yeah. six months. So you're saying if they've, if they've recovered and they haven't had any recurrence, we're going to stop. And if they're continuing to have recurrence, we'll rotate. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So-called mosaic um, prescribing. Yeah. So um, there's another question here. In Scotland, some areas are looking at community pharmacists prescribing trimethoprine for uncomplicated UTIs. And the only test is dipstick. Is this something we would agree with as a panel? Okay, can I come in there because I think it goes back to what I was saying about where's the side of the problem yes. and therefore think about what is the, you know, what's the real diagnosis. And the leaflet here gives a very good algorithm that if there are one or two symptoms that are mild, discharge, then self-care and pain relief is, uh, is the thing. Now, I would say that that is what the pharmacist should do. And if it's different, they should go and see a doctor. Dipsticks are complex because they're not very good at ruling out uh, UTI, actually. Um, and um, I think that if we were to go down that route, the danger is that, in fact, more unnecessary antibiotics would be prescribed because a lot of women with urethritis would be getting antibiotics who aren't going to benefit from it. Okay, so here's an interesting question, um, Mandy. Are, are our current urine culture techniques appropriate or should we be considering the scope for molecular testing to detect organisms that won't grow under standard lab techniques? Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of points really here. One is that uh, most labs 
get between 100 and 600 urines a day to test. Yeah. So anything that we do has got to be fairly cheap. Um, if we could reduce that number by, again, more appropriate sampling, um, then there's a possibility that you know, molecular techniques could, could come into the factor. Molecular techniques are taking over now in microbiology laboratories, but at the moment they're still expensive. Um, and so really we're focusing on more uh, serious infections first. And I think only once they're more commonplace in those infections will we get to using them for uh, UTIs and urine sampling. And of course we'll have the same problem with somebody with asymptomatic bacteria, yes. that they'll be yeah. positive. So yeah. again, you would only want to use those in yeah. people who are symptomatic. Yeah. Um, so what about, Chris, other, maybe other culture techniques? Are there any other culture techniques yeah, so, that you've been doing, you know, yeah. in poetic study? Yeah, so just to say in the Netherlands, they use a thing called a dip slide where they get the urine sample with a bit of agar in it. And then next morning you can see if the agar is full of growth or not. So that'll tell you, it'll, in a sense, quantify the bacteria present in the urine. And that yes. um, might be a kind of a triage, if, if you like, that only if that thing's positive might you send it off to the, uh, the sample off to the lab. Uh, we did a study of a, a, a technology called Flexicult, where yeah. in primary care we have an agar plate with different sections in it with antibiotics impregnated in that. Just throw a bit of urine in that, swirl it around, you can stick it in a simple cheap incubator. Next morning it'll quantify the growth and tell you about resistance. And that's another approach um, that can be used and is in fact in widespread use in Denmark. So somebody's asked, um well, should we be using three, five, or seven days treatment for UTIs? What are your thoughts? Should we have a little discussion about mm -hmm. this? Sure. There's been quite a bit of uh, study on three, five, and seven days. Um, and there is quite a plethora of data out there. But I'm not sure there's a consensus as to, you know, the, the, real, the real answer, really. Um, what are your thoughts, so, Chris? So, I think... The three days is justified by this line of thinking. The fewer antibiotics, the better. And uh, if you can get clinical cure with three days, no need to take any more because uh, more antibiotics kills off more sensitive bacteria in the gut, which allows those that are resistant to flourish. And so your chances of recurrence is higher. On the other hand, people might argue that a longer course actually kills off more bacteria and you're less likely to get recurrence. Now, my reading of the literature is that it, three days is as good as a longer course when you look at short-term outcomes, but that there's a lack of evidence on a key outcome, and that is recurrence over six months, perhaps. Yes, yeah, so if you've and, got somebody yeah. with recurrent infection, you yeah. might think about a longer course. Yeah. Well, well or, or not. I mean, I think we need the trials because yes. I could see benefits from both minimizing the antibiotic burden or hitting them hard with serious antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we not only need to look at recurrence, but the proportion of those that are resistant when they recur. Mm -hmm. And you might think re resistance in primary care isn't important, but it is. It's common. And those infections that are resistant will tend to cause suffering for twice as long as the sensitive ones, even when they're treated. So this person who's asking the question may be hinting at the Hutner systematic review on nitrofurantoin. So this is quite a complex systematic review, and it looked at different courses of nitrofurantoin. And it suggests that with three days, the clinical outcomes are not quite as good mm. as with five days. So mm -hmm. it'd be 60 to 70 percent versus 80 percent. Yeah. But there are no direct studies in the same study comparing three to five days of nitrofurantoin. They're comparing mm -hmm. three days of nitrofurantoin to three days of something else or um, three days of nitrofurantoin to five days of something else. So it's mm. it's not there's yeah. no head to head studies. Head, head -to -head studies so yeah. um, there was some suggestion in that that the longer course may be more effective. So if we've got somebody with a resistant organism, so if you're thinking of treating somebody with SBL, we would want to give a longer course in yeah. that sort of case. Yeah. 
In contrast to that, there's been some very recent evidence, um, which was presented at the British Infection Association um, meeting just last month, so this month in fact, in November 2016, which suggested that in Scotland they've looked retrospectively at outcomes and reconsultation and second courses of antibiotics following three, five and seven days of nitrofurantoin and there's no significant mm. difference between the three groups. Mm. So um, they um, in Scotland are feeling very confident that having looked at this retrospective data that they're happy yeah. to keep with the three days. Yeah. So we're going to look at that data much more carefully. So it's watch this space, but at the moment we're happy with three days for acute uncomplicated yeah. UTI. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly in the milder end, but what I would say to the Scottish is don't feel too relaxed about it because the retrospective data can't take into account case mix. The more severe cases might have been uh, given longer courses and the cases with urethritis might have been given shorter courses. Yes. And so what we really need is a prospective randomized control trial which tests a range of interventions head to head in the same population at the same time, including short courses versus long courses, high dose versus lower dose, versus symptomatic treatment, uh, versus delayed prescribing. So I think we need to have a whole new kind of framework for the kind of clinical trials that we're doing in primary care. Because as you say, A versus B, B versus mm. C, what about C versus A? And that's the problem. So we need a kind of platform of a trial that is ongoing that takes into account perhaps changing resistance and uh, that's why I think one of this is one of the most exciting fields of research in primary care at the moment really is that there's so many unanswered questions and such good opportunity for excellent primary care research here. And just talking about nitrofurantoin, the resistance rate is quite low at the moment. It's been quite low in Europe even though they've used it first line for quite a while now. But actually the drug itself, because it's got multiple uh, modes of action, the development of resistance is quite low. So the, the idea that we're going to see lots of resistance like we have with trimetoprim, I think is not going to be not, not going to be the case, you know. Mm. So I don't think we'll get as high levels of nitrofantone resistance as we have trimetoprim resistance. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you. That's a very good point to stop. Well, that's the end of um, this fifth webinar and many thanks for participating. I do hope that has made you think a little bit about the diagnosis and management of UTI. And don't forget to explore all the materials associated with this webinar. So they're all on the Target webinar um, website. Please do download and use the new Target UTI leaflet and feedback your comments to us. You can also replay the presentation read papers covering the evidence and read the PHE UTI guidance. You will soon be receiving an email asking you to reflect on how you may take forward action suggested in the webinar and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this as it will help us all to improve and contribute towards your CPD. So see you next week for webinar six when we'll be discussing managing common infections in children with Professor Alistair Hay at Bristol University. Until then, goodbye.